Okay, everybody, welcome on behalf of Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. My name is Michael Morgenstern and I'm an educator at the museum. And this morning I'm pleased to welcome you to our discussion with Renee Firestone, a Holocaust survivor from Czechoslovakia. For those of you who have not been to our museum before, Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust is the first Holocaust survivor founded Holocaust Museum in the United States. In the 1960s, a group of survivors worked together to create a memorial for their loved ones who perished in the Holocaust. And this memorial eventually became Los Angeles Museum of the Holocaust. These survivors who established our museum did so with a mission to commemorate, educate, and inspire future generations. Furthermore, they mandated that our museum should always be free to the public, making Holocaust education accessible to everyone. Even though we are not able to be in our museum's a physical space for the time being, we're still able to carry forward their mission. the Holy Temple in Jerusalem, as well as other painful and tragic moments in Jewish history. On this day of remembrance, we thank you for joining us um, to, for this opportunity to listen to an eyewitness account of Holocaust survival. As I mentioned this morning, you have the honor and privilege of listening to Renee Firestone, who will share her story with you. After Renee shares her story, you can type in questions and she'll answer as many as possible. So Renee, I'm honored to welcome you to your first Zoom talk with the museum. And you can start, you, Renee, you can start sharing your story now. Thank you so much for being with us this morning. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. I can only say, uh, Yeah. Okay. Okay. I can only say that I never could imagine that I will have to live through another uh, genocide and another uh, Holocaust. Actually, <clears throat> the only difference today is that it's not only for Jews; that this one is for everybody. And uh, every time I wake up in the morning and I realize what's going on, I, I cannot believe it. I'm now 96 years old. Could I ever imagine after the Holocaust that I will be here uh, still now? Nevertheless, here I am. And I will tell you about a story that happened to me when I was 20 years old. So it was a long time ago. And um, I'm glad that we are still remembering it because uh, <clears throat> our, our children, uh, especially the Jewish children, uh, should know about the Holocaust because that really happened only to Jewish people. And I remember I was 20 years old. Uh, as a matter of fact, 20 years old and uh, two days. Because uh, two days after my 20th birthday, uh, we <clears throat> were picked up by a truck and taken to the ghetto, which we had no idea that that's gonna happen. It was a surprise to all of us. They took us in a ghetto where we stayed for a very short time. And then we were told that we're going to Germany to work. Well, <laughs> Germany to work, we figured that's better than anything else. The war is going on. We don't have to fight. So um, 
a few days later, a truck came full of people already and they packed us in. And my parents, my mother, my father, and my little sister, Clara, who was then, if I remember, uh, she was maybe 16 years old. I, I don't really remember exactly, but she was about 16 years old. And I was two days after my 20th birthday. So, Uh, <clears throat> I am sorry. I have a note here, but I don't remember what it says. Just to tell me where you come from and tell me about your family. Oh, okay. You start in the middle, start in the beginning. All right. Um, my daughter says it, that I started in the middle, so I should go back uh, to the beginning which means that um, um, my parents were uh, well to do people. We had a beautiful home. Uh, I, I went to regular school, so did my brother and my little sister. And uh, by the way, we, we lived uh, in Czechoslovakia, which was then occupied by the Hungarians. And would it have remained Czechoslovakia, we would have never gone to Auschwitz, that's for sure. Nevertheless, we had no idea where we we're going. We were taken to a so-called ghetto. We don't know, we didn't know what that is or where it is. And they unloaded us at this ghetto and they said that we have to wait because later we're going to be taken to Germany to work. Well, <clears throat> as I said, I was 20 years old. Um, I was not very upset because I figured, well, there is a war going on and everybody has to participate. So this is what we, the Jewish people, have to do. The fact is that a few weeks after we were in the ghetto, <clears throat> we were unloaded, we, we were loaded on to a truck again. We had no idea where we we're going. They didn't tell us. And they took us to the railroad station. And, the ra and the, there was a train waiting for us. And now we were wondering, you know, people were talking to each other. We had no idea where we're going to go and what kind of work are we going to be doing. So we were on the, on the train for three days. We had no idea where we are. We, we stopped a few times, picked up people. Uh, we had no idea who they were. And uh, it was a very difficult journey, needless to say. Uh, we slept on the floor. Uh, sometimes we looked out the window. We had no idea where we are. And of course, we had no idea where we're going. Three days later, they unloaded us on a train station and walked us into a place. We had no idea what the place was. Uh, it looked like some kind of a camp. And uh, uh, the Nazis were all over. And uh, we came into this big yard like, and they told us uh, that they are gonna explain to us, of course, what we're gonna be doing and where we are. That's what we thought. Uh, the Nazis came and the first thing did, they separated the people. They took the children away from the parents. That was the first thing. So we, we were hoping that the children have a camp 
some kind of a good camp where the children will be while the adults will work. Uh, so the children were separated and then <clears throat> the old people were separated. And we, we were really hoping that these old people will go with the children and they will take care of the children. But of course, we had no idea where we were. Uh, uh, then we, be, we began to hear a word Auschwitz, Auschwitz, and we didn't know what is Auschwitz. When we found out that uh, Auschwitz was a concentration camp, but uh, we thought it was a work camp. And so now we were separated from our children and from our parents and we were taken into another camp. And uh, this camp had bunks, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, barracks, where both sides of the barracks were lined with bunks, uh, three-story high bunks. And they just told us to pick a bunk and uh, to wait. Now, we, we still had no idea where we were, why we were there, what are we going to be doing, are we going to stay, are we going to go to a factory, we had absolutely no idea. Nevertheless, I remember I climbed up on the third bunk, I didn't want anybody to be on top of me, and uh, <clears throat> My little sister was still with me, Clara, and the two of us went up on the bunk and uh, fell asleep. All of a sudden, we hear yelling, heraus, heraus, out, out. We woke up. We didn't know what, what, what does it mean, out, what do they want from us? But we saw that the people were running uh, out of the bunks and out of the barracks. So we also jumped off the bunk and ran out. And there were Nazi soldiers yelling to us um, to line up. Now, we had no idea, of course, what that meant either. But there were, there were some um, Jewish uh, people who were assigned to this job and they were telling us that we have to line up that uh, the Germans will talk to us. Here we found out that uh, some of us will work in factories and uh, they will select us, they will see who. Yeah. The Jewish guys, they, were, they picked some Jewish people for guidance, I don't know, uh, so we can understand what's going on. And these guides told us that some of us are going to be picked to work in factories and uh, some of them will be just picked to do whatever at the camp. Now, I was picked to go to the factory. And uh, I, we were all immediately separated, of course, from our parents. So I had no idea where my mother went or my father. My little sister stayed with me still, and uh, <clears throat> and we were waiting, waiting to see where we are going to go, hoping that we're going to get out of this place. Well, then one morning, uh, there was again separation, and they separated my little sister away from me which I was worried about because, I mean, I had no idea where they are taking her 
By then, we heard rumors that those who are selected are being killed, are being gassed. And of course, we didn't know, should we believe it? Could it be true? So needless to say that we were worried whenever we were separated from anybody, even a friend, we were worried. So now they separated my little sister. They took her away. And of course, I was hoping that she will go back with my parents. Nevertheless, after the Holocaust, of course, I found out that those people who were selected from us were immediately killed. And not really immediately, but they were taken to a clinic. There was a clinic in Auschwitz where a Dr. Mengele um, was... Dr. Uh, Dr. Munch. Mengele. Munch. No. Hygienic Institute. <laughs> Nevertheless, this was a clinic where they were uh, experimenting uh, on medical experiments on children, and then they killed them. And this is where my little sister eventually died. <clears throat> I stayed in Auschwitz for a little while, every morning at around four or five o'clock, the whistle blow, and we have to get up, jump off the bunk, run outside, and line up for roll call every morning. That's, that's how our day started. And we were standing for roll call. And then after uh, Mengele came and, and uh, counted us, they counted every morning, the, the group. After he counted us, we were dismissed. And now we had nowhere to go. They wouldn't allow us to go back into the bunks. And uh, there was not, nowhere else to go. So we had to stay outdoors, whether it was raining, whether it was snowing, whether it was, uh, I don't know how cold. And we never got a, another dress except the, the one that we got when we came in. So whether it was raining outside, you had to stay out in this one dress which became uh, soaked uh, and until the uh, next roll call. And after the second roll call in the evening, we were allowed to go into the barrack, back into the barrack. Well, I was uh, in Auschwitz for quite a while. And then one day I was separated from the group that I was with and uh, was packed into a cattle car and was taken away, not knowing, I did not know where I'm going, of course. And I wound up in a place called, um, oh my gosh, I forgot. Uh, I forgot the, the place. Anyway, oh, yes, I forgot it. yeah, uh, to a place called Libau, and um, we were taken to Libau, and we were at the railroad station. We still had no idea where we are and why we are there until some Nazis came and explained to us that we are in. Libau, which was in Czechoslovakia, and that uh, we are going to work in a factory. And so, of course, those of us who were there were pretty happy about it. If it's true that we are going to work in a factory, then 
then at least we know we're gonna stay alive. Sure enough, they took us into a place, a camp, where they gave us a bunk to sleep on, which was individuals, which was for each person a bunk. And we were in a very nice place indoors. And uh, we dis they, dis they told us that in the morning when the whistle blows, we have to run out and line up in for roll call. And then we're gonna go to work. And sure enough, next morning, the whistle blows again very early in the morning. I don't even remember what time. And uh, a Nazi officer shows up and selects people, points at, the, points at them, and whoever is pointed at has to come out. And uh, I am in that group. And then another Nazi officer shows up and tells us to walk. We had to follow him. And uh, he takes us into a factory. And uh, the factory was producing snow chains for German tanks. So <clears throat> uh, we worked in this factory. We came into this factory. The foreman in the factory was Czech, a Czech man. And so I immediately got friendly with him because I spoke the language. And uh, he made me sort of like a forelady. He, he showed me what we have to do. And he told me that I will have to watch that everybody does the right thing. And so I, I became like, like a poor lady, which was already a much better uh, position than being just a worker. And uh, <clears throat> um, uh, we, we were in this camp, we, as I said, we had, much better uh, uh, they treated us much better because we were treated by the factory not by the Nazis and um, we had each a separate bed uh, a bunk really uh, but a separate one so that everybody had his own and we worked uh, from early morning till very late at night, but the factory supplied us with food. So it wasn't as bad as Auschwitz was, of course. And here, uh, one of the Czech foremen uh, befriended me. And so he was bringing me food uh, almost every day. So this was already bearable. Of course, we didn't know how long we're gonna be here and what's next, whether they are still gonna kill us because now we found out that all those who remained in Auschwitz eventually are killed. And uh, here I am, I couldn't believe that I will survive, of course. And uh, when the war ended, and uh, <clears throat> and I was free, I, I could leave the camp. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know who in my family survived. And uh, <clears throat> then I found out that many of the people are going to Hungary. I don't know why, but apparently Hungary opened some kind of uh, camps. Of course, they were different than, <laughs> than the Auschwitz camps, 
they they made some camps for those who came from the camp. And uh, I got a, a bed there. And um, <clears throat> I remember I was wondering what am I gonna do now? Where should I go? Should I try to go home? Uh, the borders were changed. Of course, uh, Czechoslovakia was uh, dismissed. It was no longer. And so I had no idea what to do or where to stay. So I decided I stay in Budapest, in Hungary, until I find somebody I know and, and maybe, you know, join somebody who knows what's going on. Well, a few days later, I ran into my brother. I remember I was in a school looking through the list of people who survived. And when I was leaving, I found nobody. And I, then I was leaving and through this double door and all of a sudden I pushed the door and the door didn't give. So I stepped back and the door opened and my brother was standing there. Then I found out that my brother was in a Hungarian forced labor camp from which he escaped. He escaped to Slovakia where he became a, a freedom fighter. They were called, uh, oh my gosh, my memory is getting low. Um, anyway, it will come Partisans. to me. What, what did you say? Partisans. What, what were they? Partisans. Partisans? Yeah, he became a partisan. Yes. And uh, survived, also very lucky. And uh, we got together now, and now we had to figure out where, what, what, what we're going to do now. We were planning to look for our parents, of course, which uh, unfortunately didn't happen. But then we found out that my, from some prisoners, that my father is in Czechoslovakia in, in a, a camp where the prisoners who were sick were taken. It was a hospital actually. And uh, I think it was called Terezin. And uh, that somebody said that they saw my father there. So my, my brother and I, of course, took the train to Terezin. And sure enough, we found my father who was dying uh, of uh, <clears throat> just uh, just from not being able to eat and and not being able to take care of himself, of course. So we kept going, of course. We settled in, Bra in Prague, my brother and I decided that we'll stay in Prague so we can be close to my father and we can see him often. And uh, <clears throat> now what are we gonna do? Because my brother was a partisan, the Czech government gave us a beautiful apartment in Prague and uh, <clears throat> we settled there. I uh, enrolled, uh, both my brother and I, we enrolled in a school. Uh, we didn't know yet what we're gonna be doing. And um, then we decided that we have to start to do something to earn some money. We had, not, we had no money. And uh, we decided that we're going to try to do something. So my brother 
rented a sewing machine and uh, uh, we bought some materials and we started to make big skirts at that time that was in fashion the full full circle skirts but my brother who was an artist started to paint these skirts we made a circular skirt and he painted on them and people were just just absolutely amazed about it and they were buying it and we were doing very well uh, financially we now had money and we had a beautiful apartment and i remember that every evening we went out on the main street and we found survivors there always some survivors either hungarian or czech who had nowhere to sleep and so we took them to our house we have i think three rooms so we let them sleep over and so we have that a lot of lot of survivors this way and then next morning they had breakfast with us and left and some went home some a few remained so uh, i also uh, we also found my brother a friend of my brothers from the forced labor camp and uh, he my brother brought him home and then we became very friendly and uh, we got married and so i was married to this man whom i loved very much later because he was not just very good but also very smart and uh, he settled in prague until uh, something better would come and of course uh, my brother and i we were still doing the work we were doing and uh, i'm trying to remember why we were separated my my brother had a girlfriend in kosice in czechoslovakia before the war and he found her and they got married also and so uh, for a little while we were staying together and then we both separated our own ways and uh, but by now i had a good business uh, making the skirts and uh, then i decided that maybe i should do more than just skirts and that's that's what i became i became a fashion designer well known and uh, we never went back to our home because the hungarians occupied it and then the russians took over and so we remained in prague and got uh, got together with i don't even remember how we got together i found an an aunt in the united states can't remember how i found her nevertheless we started to uh, communicate and she insisted that we come to the united states and of course uh, i was very happy to accept that invitation and sure enough and uh, we came here then my daughter was born and uh, i was already a known designer so we had no problem you know with earning money and here i am after all these years uh, i uh, 
I stopped being uh, in my business, my gosh, how many years ago? Um, quite a few years ago. And then also they found out, of course, that I'm a Holocaust survivor. And they asked me to talk about it. And I started to lecture in schools. And that's what I'm doing now. So here I am. If there are any questions, I will try to answer if I know the answer. So let me see. Let me hear you. Renee, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, and just as a reminder to the audience, Renee Firestone has been sharing her story all over the world for many decades, um, all over Southern California. And so... Uh, That's true, um, not all over California, but all over, you're right. So she's been very instrumental in really in Holocaust education in our community. And so we thank you so much. Um, we do have a few questions from the audience. First yeah. question, um, somebody would like to know if you um, can tell us the names of your parents. And you mentioned your sister was Clara, but if uh, the names of your parents and your brother my my father was Morris, and my mother was uh, well Joran Johanna in in English, but it was in Hungarian Joran. And your brother? Uh, my brother was Frank. And what was your husband's name? <coughs> my husband was Bernard. He was a friend of my brother's and they accidentally found each other and that's how he came to live with us and we became married. Thank you. Uh, um, what was life like for your family before 1944? What was I didn't what was get your life like before before the Holocaust like before forty four before the Holocaust <clears throat> before the Germans invaded your your country. That's right. Yeah. Well, you know, we lived in Czechoslovakia, but the very end of it, where it was joined with the Soviet Union. And then when the Hungarians took over, then of course uh, we were deported and uh, we didn't know what happened to that region. But when, when we came back, uh, that region already belonged to Russia. So we couldn't get, stay home. We went there, but we couldn't, didn't want to stay no, there. Before 44. Your life early, your early life, your family life before the war. Before the war? Yeah. Oh, before the war, my father had a wonderful business. He was, uh, he had a men's tailoring business and um, in a very fashionable uh, neighborhood, well, well known. He was very well known. And we had a beautiful home. I had this little sister whose name was Clara and a brother who was Frank. And, uh, and we, we had a very beautiful childhood. What we went to do? school. What did you do? Um, went to school. And did I, what other things <clears throat> did you do? Went skiing. Oh, well, we, we had a very good life because at winter time, you know, I skated and, and skied, and we had wonderful friends who did the same. At summertime, we had a beautiful um, swimming pool, public pool, where we had uh, tickets always, and uh, that's how we spend the summer. 
So we really, I really, when I was, when I was still in Czechoslovakia, I lived. This is Renee at the pool. Oh, <laughs> oh, this is this is a picture. She's in the middle. Uh, this is, and the right is a friend of mine who died in Auschwitz. Anyway, uh, so I had a very good childhood, a very good life, and uh, and then it all went to nothing. And uh, I came back from Auschwitz, and my father was already in a hospital, very ill. He died there a few weeks later. My mother was immediately killed when we came into Auschwitz. And my little sister, I don't really know. She was killed, but I don't know when because she was taken away to this clinic first. Well, that, that's about my life. Thank you, Renee. We have a question from, from John Keane. He would like to know, since you've shared your story for so many years on almost a daily basis, how has it affected you these last few months not being able to go to museums and speak or to schools or? Oh, right now? Yes, well, how has it affected you to not be able to do this? The, for the the, this thing that's happening is affecting me very much. And as I said, I am now 96 years old. So it's not so easy for me to uh, come and go. And um, <clears throat> uh, I, uh, I still speak uh, through Zoom. Zoom. So I still tell my story uh, here at Zoom. home. And yeah, thank God to Zoom. And uh, that's what I'm still doing. Even though I don't know if I mentioned that when I came to the United States, I became a well-known fashion designer and, uh, and, and a speaker, a Holocaust lecturer. So that's what I'm still doing. Uh, I'm doing it from home, of course. And, uh, and I, I hope that uh, People do understand what actually really happened. It has been a long time since then. A lot of things happened in the world. And I just hope that they will remember still happening. The, the Holocaust because there are still terrible things happening, unfortunately. I, of course, never dreamed that I'm going to live through another Holocaust. And here I am. Any other questions? Yes. Um, and of course, we're so grateful for this technology because you're still able to share your story with people. Um, what language did you speak growing up with your family? Well, um, I spoke Czech because I went to Czech school. And I spoke Hungarian at home because my father was Hungarian. And I knew German. So I spoke those three languages. Um, we have a few questions about some of the films that you were in, um, Swimming in Auschwitz and After Auschwitz. Can you talk a little bit about um, your role in those films? Well, I don't know if I remember. John Keynes. Okay, so, um, it's, it's John Keynes. I, I know that uh, swimming in, in Auschwitz is John Keynes. So maybe John remember better than I was in that film. Well, these are documentaries about um, partially yeah, my, about women. Yes. I'm sorry. I don't want to interrupt, but I will. Um, okay. The question is, is quite broad when you say, can you speak about your role? 
um, in a documentary, that's that's quite a, quite a broad question to ask her. Can your um, listener be a little more specific what they want to know? Okay. Um, yeah. So we can circle back if um, to the audience members who asked about swimming in Auschwitz and after Auschwitz. If you have more specific questions, you can type them in. Um, in the meantime, we have another question. Did you ever go back to Europe after living in the United States? Yes, I did. Many times. I did. Many times. A few times, yes. Not many times. Not many, but Not a many. Few, few times. Yes, I did go back. She, she led... Um, there's a school here for those who are not in Los Angeles called Shalhevet. It's a, a Jewish day school. And she, for six years, she led the graduating class on a trip that they would take that's similar to March of the Living, where they would go to Poland to Auschwitz for a week and then go to Israel, to Israel for a week. Yes. And she led that for six <clears throat> years. In addition to um, going back every time that we had to film. Yeah, when, when we did a film, I always went back to Europe. Yeah. The I, last days, for instance, took her back to, took all of us back to my both my parents' home. Um, hometowns. Yeah, we went back. And, and there was her, a, her, Russian family in there. Yeah, her her town is now in the Ukraine. Yes, and she said that the, this Russian woman said to me, I told her that that's our home, and that I just came to see, and she said, oh, go go to the closet if you need any clothes. Your clothes are still there. That was when you came back from the camp. Well, that was when you came back from the camp. Yes, yeah. after I came back from okay, the camp. We were, I was talking about when we went for the film. Sorry. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Then. Anyway, we, you know, I, I was a speaker. I still am. I still speak here in Los Angeles. Um, this is a an important question. Do you have? photos of your parents, brother and sister that you were able to save? No. I have I have picture of my brother. You have pictures of everyone. She, Do I? Yes. She has pictures of everyone, but right. not that she saved. She the same aunt that she told you she oh. came to here. <clears throat> yeah, my aunt she, in the United States. She visited um, one time with her son um, in, Czechoslovakia. In, in Czechoslovakia, but my my grandparents were sending photos to the family. So because they had all the photos, we were lucky enough to have those photos. Yeah, I have some, including a wedding photo of a cousin that included at least 30 other cousins in the picture. So we have actually pictures of an extended family, which is rare. Yeah, my parents are on, on that picture. My brother is on. My it. mother was maybe 10 years and old it, in the picture. And my little sister was, I don't know, maybe five, six years old. <clears throat> yeah. Yes, I do have some pictures. Can you get that picture? Hold on, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show a couple. She's gonna try to show you. Anyway, any other questions? Michael? Okay, this, let me see if I can oh, do it without the shadow. This is my father. This is my grandfather, her father, Morris Weinfeld. Can we see that? There's you without the shadow. He was in the military in Hungary. That was in First World War. And this is my and this brother. This is her brother, Frank. That's Frank, who was the partisan. 
Can you see them? Yes, we can see. Thank you so much. The, okay. um, the picture of her sister is, to, is in uh, more buried in storage um, with some other photos. It would be hard for me to find yeah. that one. But you know what? I can maybe get one more. Anyway. So uh, what were we? Uh, the question she's gonna bring it yeah so yes while we're waiting for the last photo um, yeah. did you come from a religious family no no my parents were not religious no and um, i and i had a lot of non-jewish friends uh, and my parents had some non-jewish friends Okay, excuse me. This is a, a, an encapsulation from the full photo of the wedding. This is my grandparents with my mother at about age 10. Unfortunately, the full photo I thought was on the wall, but it's, it's also buried with our well, cadre of pictures. So you saw some of them. Some of them. Maybe you can imagine what kind of family we were. Yes. Um, Renee, we have a question for you. What message would you like to give to students today who are listening to you speak? Well, you know, I don't know what's going on in the schools now. I'm not that much uh, connected with schools, but I just tell children not to, uh, <clears throat> what is it called? Oh my gosh, hold on a minute. Uh, <clears throat> what's that, Clara? Um, for ne 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 beseyene ka feketere not to not to talk about discriminate to that, not discriminate yeah I'm, that's the most important thing that children do not discriminate about each other each other i mean or anyone ne, really anyone and, and it, uh, that's the biggest problem today I think discrimination has been uh, deadly to many many people not only Jews not only black but in general people discriminate people judge other people and I, that's one thing children should learn not to do. It's, <clears throat> it's quite shocking that 20 years into the 21st century and 75 plus years after a Holocaust like we had, that people are still discriminating and that anti-Semitism is worse today than it was, than it was prior to World War yeah. II. It is shocking. Well, I don't know why people, are they afraid of anything or why they discriminate? But of course, uh, my teaching, my lectures are definitely to make, un to, to make them understand that discrimination does nothing good but only harm, only harm and we don't want to hurt each other, and we shouldn't. And, and Renee, and, sorry. Yes. Oh, go ahead. No, I, ju I just said that I, I think discrimination is a deadly, deadly thing, and it should never be done to any people. Everybody that, uh, that was born in this world has the right to be here. So I don't know why 
people discriminate. You don't want to be friends with somebody, don't be friends, but you don't have to, uh, you know, make them an enemy. Well, this is why, again, we're so grateful to have you here to share your story and why we've had and why you've been doing this for so many years. Um, as a final question, people would like to know what happened to your brother if he came to the United States and had a family. Yes, he did. When my when we came to the United States, when we left Europe and came to the United States, my brother he, was in Israel. Yeah, he my my uncle went <clears throat> with his wife and his son. He he had a son born in Czechoslovakia, like I was. Um, and they went to Israel when when I came to the United States. And my uncle fought in the War of Independence and the Six Day War. And then he and then I he had had enough. So thirteen about thirteen. Wait a minute. Yeah, about thirteen years yes, after he went to Israel, we brought him to the we brought him the to family, the family the to the family. United States. By then, he also had a um, my cousin's a daughter, daughter uh, Tamar, yeah. and he had a son, John. Yeah, and the children are still here in Los Angeles. Yeah. But both my brother and his wife passed, passed away, away quite a while ago. Well. Um, we are so indebted to you for all of the work that you've done throughout your life uh, um, to teach about the Holocaust and to teach against discrimination. And, you know, I want to let you know, you mentioned earlier that you're grateful for Zoom and this is a wonderful tool because you have today, you had over a hundred people listening to your talk from all over the world, including your friend, Bernice Krantz from London, who wanted to say hi to you. Um, you had people listening from the United, all over the country and the world. And, you I know, again, right now, yes. I can't believe it. I was wondering who is uh, listening to me. And um, when they told me that you have so many people, I couldn't believe it. How did well, you even get through them? <laughs> this is, you know, part of the benefits of being able to work with technology the way that we do. And um, I also would like to say thank you so much to Claire Firestone, Renee's daughter, who was um, yes. facilitating some of the tech side. Yes. Thank you so much, yes. Renee. Yes. Who is uh, my pleasure? Who is uh, helping me? Uh, my, 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 memory, mother, my, my mother. My knows, memory. My mother knows that she can look at the screen, and everybody can see her, and she can see sometimes other pictures of other people. But she still has no clue what Zoom is. So every time she's going to do a session, she asks where the people are. She thinks they're that they're somewhere in one place. Yeah, and I have to explain to her. No, everybody is doing this from home. I understand it now. I understand so it. You had an audience from all over the world today this morning, and um, it's amazing. I, I, you know, who, who is far be besides a, Bernice? Who is farthest away? Um, from where? Farthest I could tell, but I see from the pe people in the comments have also just been saying thank you and. Um, you know, everybody who listened to you this morning really appreciated you. And again, um, I know you, you've been so active in our museum and in institutions and all over, you know, all over the world. And um, that being said, I would also like to remind everybody who's watching now uh, that, of course, we would love to welcome you back at the museum whenever it's safe. That being said, um, we are closed for the time being. But we regularly have uh, virtual programs like this. Um, so please follow our website or our Facebook page to tune in. We have survivor speakers every Thursday at 11 o'clock. Um, so feel free I, to I, uh, listen. I really thank them. I, I can't even believe it that you Talk have to so many. to them. Yeah, I, I just want to 
thank all of you who are listening to me because uh, you know I, I i don't know how much longer will i be able to do this and uh, and uh, we need people to remember and to follow up when we are not here anymore spread the word the story yeah they they should they should tell the story after we are gone so i thank them for listening to me michael yes we say once you've heard a survivor speak you now become a witness and mm -hmm. it's your obligation now to, tell to bear the, witness yes and to tell, tell the, story. the story yes everyone who listened to you this morning will share your story now so thank again you. we thank you so much and um again everybody listening please tune in to our talk next week and every other program that we have um thank you again and renee we wish you the and best I, and I thank them for listening to me and yes. everyone wear your mask and be safe yes <laughs> Yes, did you hear what she said? We heard what she said. Everyone wear the mask and be safe. And be safe.